All right, there we go. You cannot take back anything. I can't delete nothing. It's going to be there for life. So uh, without further ado, thank you all for joining us. It's virtual presentation week. It's session two, and we have um, an amazing presentation today, but I do not want to start without saying thank you to our wonderful sponsors. And if you give me a second, maybe two, here we go. We have, I uh, want to say thank you to our, our uh, supporting sponsors, um, VALA, Virginia Assisted Living Association and Senior Living Guide. We do have them on, um, on the call today. We uh, want to thank our exhibiting sponsors, which are GenCare Senior Medical Center, Bayada. We do have somebody from Bayada on here, Aegis uh, Sciences Corporation, Commonwealth Senior Living, Mako Medical, which I believe we have somebody from Mako Medical today, Carlton Building Services, Comfort Keepers, Morrison Living, Prime Plus Senior Center, and National Physiatry. Uh, we want to thank them for being our exhibiting sponsors for this event. And our silver sponsor, Next Chapters of Virginia. And our gold sponsor, Caption Call, which you'll be hearing from them in a few moments. And then our keynote sponsor, Anthem, which Micah Hall will be sharing with us as well. And, um, I'm, and with that, I'm going to lead it over to Micah Hall, and I'll let him share a little bit about Anthem and what he does. Micah, I will now mute Micah. <laughs> Good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm used to saying morning as well all day, Micah. So uh, I, I, I mirror that. Uh, great to be back and see you all again. Uh, I, I won't take up too much of your time. I had an opportunity to see your smiling faces earlier today. Just grateful for the opportunity to partner with Micah and the organization to bring forth such great information as what we received today from Doug, uh, just looking at how we impact our communities, how we focus on just bringing our seniors, those that deal with Alzheimer's into a different light and making sure that we're all on the same page and caring for our family. I, I must say in this um, run of life, um, being in this Anthem network and being a part of this networking opportunity with Micah, I've really been blessed as an individual. Um, and I state that on a personal level, one good thing about this format and being able to connect with folks, whether it be locally or in Texas, uh, where James is sitting right now. Um, you create a, your own avenue and own circle of friends that end up being advocates for you. And a few months ago, I reached out to Micah and he won't bring this up, but I will. Um, I had a, a family member um, and I have multiple family members that have been dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's uh, over and over. My father, my uh, aunt, at large and I ran into a situation with an aunt that was here locally that was moving to New York and I reached out to him to ask for advice and it was on a late Friday night where I know he was spending time with his family and at that point in time he reached out to someone they reached out to me first thing on a Saturday morning to be able to help guide and direct us in the right way to go to take care of my aunt and I'm grateful for my circle of friends I call it my extended family uh, that's what this is, is all about that's what the networking world is about making those connections, being able to help one another. Um, and I heard uh, Stephen and Lisa talking earlier before we started just with large families. Uh, what had brought me into this world of Anthem and why I have stayed for these last six years is because I care for seniors. And I grew up with a, a father that it was 23 out of 24 kids. So he was never, he never had opportunity to stay at home. His community helped raise him. He worked for seniors, cutting their grass and doing things for them so he can have a place to stay to get a hot meal. Um, and in that process of me growing up, he took me to, to those same homes of those seniors that provide that level of care for him. And now in turn in my life, I have that ability to touch the lives of our seniors uh, here in the state of Virginia. So I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be a part of this. I'm glad that Anthony was able to be able to sponsor uh, this great event of the wealth of information that you will receive over the next few days. And uh, I don't think I introduced myself, but I'm Micah Hall. I am the director for our Medicare sales department for the entire state of Virginia. And I uh, just once again, grateful to be here. And thank you, Micah, for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Micah, my brother from another mother. If you haven't noticed, we're twins. So uh, now I'm gonna pass it off to Caption Call, Lisa Modishert and Stephen Demary. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from Virginia. We have 65 degrees here currently, so quite excited about that. Um, 
I am speaking as a local representative for Caption Call and have been blessed to be a part of Michael's, Micah's networking um, groups for quite a while now, um, thanks to COVID. Uh, that is one shining bright light. But we are here today specifically to help add benefit and uh, greater value to the professionals here in the senior care industry. James Lee is going to be speaking on um, senior living as a service. Um, we provide a valuable service that helps anyone that you care for that has hearing loss. Um, if I could see everybody's faces, I'd say, let me see a show of hands of somebody that knows someone that has hearing loss. I think we would all be raising our hand at this point. Um, Air Program is a federally funded service that provides captioning amplified phones. Um, and my colleague, um, our National Business Development Director, Steve, is going to share a little bit about the importance of making sure that those that you care for stay connected and can communicate effectively on the phone. So, Steve. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, nice words, Micah Hall. Uh, uh, it's truly nice to be a part of this this group, and we appreciate Micah Hunt for inviting us to be here. Um, <clears throat> I um, uh, for coming from Chicago area, um, it's it's nice to be a part of uh, these the, you folks across the the entire country. So um, thanks for allowing us to be a part of this event. I'm just going to run through just a, a few big bullets um, right off the the screen here, and essentially, um, approximately 30 million Americans. Um, have hearing loss, have some issue with hearing loss. However, only about 25% are actually doing anything about it. And it usually takes about seven years for someone to even make a decision about doing anything for their hearing loss. Uh, undetected, untreated hearing loss can lead to uh, social anxiety, isolation, dementia, um, uh, loneliness. Uh, there's a higher risk of falling for these folks. So there's a lot of um, hidden issues going on with hearing loss that I don't think most of the public is aware. Uh, a recent study of 14,000 individuals revealed that talking on the phone was the second most important um, communication situation, second to one-on-one -on -one communication. So it's very important um, to, to be able to hear and speak on the phone, especially during this pandemic. As we all know, staying connected has been a challenge. Uh, staying socially connected, especially for uh, people of a certain age that want to stay connected to their um, caregivers, their doctors, family and friends and other services has become very important for, for a large group of people. Um, some of the statistics out there, this is NIDCD out of Washington, D.C. They estimate one in three people in the U.S. between ages 65 and 74 has a hearing loss and nearly half over the age of 75 have a hearing issue. Um, and age is the strongest predictor. So as you get older, 90% of adults with hearing loss are age 50 and older. Um, and those that are 80 have the most severe. So as you get older, it's called presbycusis and your hearing loss just becomes worse. Um, nearly half of the people over age 75 have hearing loss. So they're still using the phone. So they're gonna be having some difficulty talking on the phone. Adult men in their 50s are three times as likely to have a hearing loss. Uh, Regard, um, versus women of the same age. And then the hearing loss becomes, the rates become a little bit more consistent as, as we all get older. And then women typically have a more, more of a problem with uh, lower frequencies than higher frequencies. Um, our service is, is uh, Title IV of the ADA was developed to create IPCTS, which is Internet Protocol Caption Telephone Service. It's a no-cost solution that allows us to provide this service to individuals with hearing loss that have difficulty communicating over the phone. Uh, we're regulated by the FCC, um, being good stewards of the government. We do allow all of these patients and, and phone users to uh, turn captions on or off as needed. Um, and we are only paid based on captions that are delivered successfully and accurately. We're not paid by the number of phones given out or anything of that nature. So we're, we follow very strict government guidelines. Um, and uh, uh, patients, your residents and patients and, and folks with hearing loss can be certified for this service um, by any of their, their caregiver professionals. And then once certified, essentially it comes to us, we take the ball, we have a red carpet service where we will contact them, um, arrange installation, whether that's live or in person, or excuse me, live or uh, over the phone. If it is live and in person, we are, 
uh, have 250 folks around the country. We follow CDC guidelines. We wear PPE. So we're very aware of the challenges with COVID. So if that's the case, we will um, do it live. If they want it over the phone, we'll do it over the phone as well. And then can always go back later for a follow up. Um, and then mainly the design of the phone, just a couple big bullets is it's a nice big screen. Um, so it's easy to see. So it's very uh, easy once it's installed uh, for the person to use it. It works just like any other phone. Um, and then one of the big features is um, you can save phone calls. They can read back the text and hear the phone call later. And uh, they could also hit speakerphone. There's that little green button there. They hit speakerphone and that allows them to um, be hands-free. So if they're getting counseled for a hearing aid or something of that nature, they have their hands free to be able to manipulate the hearing aid, take notes, do some other things of that nature. So that's a very nice feature. Um, and those for that are more sophisticated. There's also a mobile app for iPhone and Android where you can take your um, captions on the go or the backyard or the courtyard or wherever it may be. And then finally, um, um, if you, if anyone does suspect they have a hearing loss or have issues hearing, ringing in the ears, turning up the TV louder, can't hear in the presence of background noise, um, the, the best thing to do is just contact, contact your hearing health care provider or audiologist to get a full hearing evaluation. That's the best place to start. And then they'll point you in the right direction. Uh, if you need any more info from us, certainly go to our website, captioncall.com. Um, for um, some other steps on certification, or please reach out to Lisa um, for any questions or anything else you need from us at all. And uh, we certainly appreciate being here. So thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. I pre oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just gonna give one quick share um, because I noticed some of the towns in Virginia that are in attendance today are in rural areas. Um, one thing that differentiates Caption Call from other captioning phone providers that you may be familiar with is that we do provide, um, we have options for no landline users and also for those that do not have internet. Um, that's been a struggle in the past and a, and a roadblock for many to have this wonderful service provided at no cost. Um, but we do, we've overcome those challenges and we are able to serve those in more rural communities as well. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Steve, for your uh, presentation. Michael Hall, again, thank you all for that and for the information. And without further ado, we're gonna get into the, today's presentation. Um, this is James Lee. He's a, a very good friend of mine and a, a, an amazing person in the senior living space. And uh, I'm really excited that he's going to be sharing what he's going to be sharing. And it's a good one. Senior living is a service, not a place. James Lee, it is all yours. Thanks, everyone. Happy to be here um, all the way from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I, I am okay. We had a lot of winter craziness last week. Um, we got away pretty unscathed. Uh, except we ran out of water for four days. Um, that wasn't the hard part. We were potty training during the same time. So that was the uh, difficult part. But I'm happy to say that Evelyn is 95% uh, potty trained and we've got water back on. So uh, happy I could join you all here from San Antonio. Sorry, I don't have the Texas accent. Uh, it, it only comes out if we're drinking. So maybe later you can hear that. Um, today, I want to talk to you about, um, I, by the way, um, if you want to know more about me or my work or my history, feel free to engage with me afterwards. I won't spend, you know, today going on about that, but I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. I want to go ahead and dig right into the topic here. Um, and uh, a big part of my work in the senior living industry for the past 12 years uh, has kind of evolved to this concept that senior living doesn't have to be centralized to a physical location. And so because we have the benefit of the chat function here today, I'm going to engage you right away in this presentation and ask for your input here real quick. Outside of senior living, I'd like for you to think about what business or what industry is very successful today that used to be brick and mortar, but is no longer necessarily brick and mortar. So a business or a service that used to be brick and mortar, you had to physically go to that location, but now they're pretty successful and you don't have to go physically into that space to do it. Would love to your thoughts. Let's go ahead and put that in the chat box and I'll use that as kind of a, uh, a precedent to this conversation. 
And really, I'm just looking for the example I'm already thinking of to show up on the chat function. A lot of good examples. Uh, medical office, telehealth, bookstore, library, Netflix and film, sorry, Blockbuster, RIP. Uh, another one here for library, grocery store, movie theater, absolutely. Think about businesses that 20 years ago relied upon you to physically be there. It's not to say that you don't go there anymore. And really, I love the example of movie theater, grocery stores, restaurants, um, gyms even. Uh, that's a great example. The, these are places that you may have kind of a hybrid. You may go to them physically, but you also benefit from their, their know-how and their service without the physical location of being there. And I wonder how many times has senior living evolved to go beyond a brick and mortar service. So that's really kind of the spirit of today's conversation. Um, I, let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. All right. So um, I, I, I like to think I'm a storyteller. So instead of giving you an agenda for what we're going to talk about, I wanted you to visualize the story that we're going to talk about here today. Um, and the stories are basically split up into three separate uh, uh, acts or segments. The first is the setup. You know, what's the problem? What's the, the hero of the journey facing? What's the major problem there? Um, and act two is kind of the struggle. The hero goes through the struggle. And then at some point, there's a turnaround, uh, a resolution, and we go on to the finale. So um, this is kind of how I'd like to structure our conversation today. Uh, and with respect to my industry, senior living, and to probably all of our uh, shared interests here, the problem that I want to talk about is the problem that we create, uh, that our industry creates. And so uh, before we get to that, we need to talk about the, um, the person for whom we are solving those problems. In other words, our customers. What is their journey? What is their problem? So um, today we're going to go through a little bit of human psychology, we're going to go through a business strategy, we're going to try to make all of that uh, work together in one cohesive conversation. So let's start here. Um, you've probably heard of Abraham Maslow, and there's a fairly good chance you've seen this pyramid of needs before. Um, in senior living, we talk a lot about occupancy and care, and uh, certainly all of those things are important. But when you take the business aspect out of it and you think about our customer, what are their needs? What are the needs that our seniors, that older adults have? And uh, this shouldn't have to be said, but let's go ahead and say it. Seniors have exactly the same need as any other adult group. You know, you don't have needs that retire when you hit a magical age. You don't hit 55 or 65 or 75 and these needs suddenly go away. They're exactly the same needs that you have when you're 25 years old. They may look a little bit different, but at its core, we all seek love and belonging. At our core, we all seek esteem and self-actualization. There are things that never retire for, for a person. Um, the drive for purpose and influence. I had a conversation with somebody um, this week, in fact. She didn't uh, identify with the word senior, but she was okay with the term uh, older adult. So I'll say older adult. Uh, she's 72 years old by, you know, her definition, she fits this middle category of people that isn't really our customer in senior living, but she feels a little bit kind of in a no man's land of uh, wanting to share her voice, wanting to find purpose, but wanting to have an audience that's, that's listening to what she has to say. She told me that for her, purpose meant influence. Not something to do, not you know something fun for me to go do, but influence. And think about that. What areas have you ever felt purpose in that you didn't influence? Maybe it's your work, maybe it's family, maybe it's your friendships. If you have purpose in that feeling, you have influenced that environment. And I challenge us as an industry to think about how many times have we um, asked our our customers, our seniors, to influence their environment, influence the products they receive, influence the services they receive, influence how senior living communities are even constructed. So I want to take Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs here and dissect it just a little bit uh, it, from the lens of our uh, senior customer. 
there's, there's basically three categories here of, of, of human need according to uh, the psychologist Abraham Maslow. They're your basic needs, they're your psychological needs, and they are your self-fulfillment needs. Again, whatever age you are, um, you may be in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and above. Um, I, I ask you to think through, are these stages of needs, are these hierarchy of needs relevant to you? I'll bet you we're all going to raise our hands to this. So we've got, well, we've got basic needs, right? So this is just, just your, I need all of this to survive. These are your physiological and safety needs. Do I have food? Do I have water? Do I have a place to live? Um, these, are the, these are the basic things that all human beings need. And the concept behind Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that you can't move to a higher level of need until your first level is taken care of, right? Um, so basic needs, you know, we, we uh, acquire the resources to be able to meet those needs, and then we move up. We move up to psychological needs. Um, so here we're talking about respect, recognition, family, esteem, status. And think about for most of us, where do we gain that sense of respect? Where do we gain that sense of self-esteem? Um, for some of us, it may be career. For some of us, it may be volunteering. It may be family. Um, I don't subscribe to the idea that you can only have self-esteem and status if you're in a high-powered position. You can have status in your community. You can have status in your family. But there is, um, there is a strive that we all have to feel this sense of psychological uh, needs. And then you go further still from there. Um, and now you're looking at self-fulfillment needs. Are you reaching your full potential as a human being? Um, I, I forget the exact quote, but uh, Abraham Maslow said something to the effect of what a person can be, he must be. He didn't use both uh, pronouns there, so I'm going to modify that. Whatever a person can be, he or she must be. And that's basically the concept of, uh, of, that, of the hierarchy of human needs. Now, here's what's interesting for me. When you look at the pyramid, okay, you have to risk something in order to grow. You have to risk something in order to grow. It is our human right to accept risk. It's risky for me to live in Texas. It's risky for me to go out on my own and, and build a business of my own. But I am willing to take a look at those risks, accept it, and try to move forward. Think about how many times we remove risk for our seniors. You can either move up towards that hierarchy or you can move backwards towards safety. You're never really standing still. You're moving forward or you're moving backwards. Senior living communities, let me go back here just a second. I want, this is the complete look. So if you take a look at your screen, um, these are examples, by the way, hopefully you can see my mouse. I'm pointing towards the right-hand side of the screen. Th these are examples. Th this isn't even a complete list. And what I'm, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna transition to what typical senior living communities offer in terms of this lens, this perspective. So take a look at how much goes away. This is not to say in any way that senior living is bad. I've worked for senior living organizations for 12 years. I aspire to, to have senior living organizations be clients of mine for the rest of my career. So this is not a judgment of quality. This is merely a statement of what we actually provide for in our communities. So where does the rest of it go? Where are we trying to provide this uh, level of psychological and self-fulfillment needs? For most senior living communities, we lump that into one department. Um, any guesses on what department is responsible for everything that's missing on this slide? You can chat it into your chat box. I don't think I can see it because I have too many screens. Let me see if I can get there. Well, I can't see the chat function, but the, the answer for us is resident engagement, activities, whatever you want to call it. Um, but there is an inherent flaw in that. The way that we structure senior living, the way that we package up our costs and, and, and goods, we take care of your basic needs, and then we take care of maybe some of your psychological needs, but everything else has gone away. I want to transition from psychology now to business a little bit. 
Um, I specifically didn't use numbers because the numbers are going to be different based on, you know, whether you work in senior housing or you are a partner to senior housing. But more important than, than the numbers, I wanted to represent visually what a business model for traditional senior living looks like. So um, let's say this is a average occupied community. Um, the operating expenses here in yellow slash orange, whatever color hue that is, uh, your non-operating expenses that you have to pay you know, every single month, your, your uh, debt payments, your rent, you know, non-operating expenses here. And then at, after all of that said and done, you've hopefully got a little bit of profit. Senior living businesses, not to oversimplify, but can pursue one of two routes. You're either going to differentiate based on quality, meaning you're the best and the brightest in your market, or you're going to be the cost leader. People who try to play in the middle, I think, confuse what their value proposition is. But you're either going to differentiate based on we provide the best care, the best food, the best activities, uh, and you try to get residents that way, or we are a no frills um, community and we're here to give you something good at an affordable price. Those really are the two ways that you can go. Senior living has what, what's called high operating leverage, meaning you've got a lot of fixed costs. In other words, you've got a lot of real estate to pay for. Our seniors, our residents who live in these communities, they're not just paying for caregivers. They're not just paying for food. What they're paying for is bricks and mortar. And think about the earlier part of our conversation, those businesses that used to be brick and mortar that are not just doing okay now, but are thriving. Think about Netflix. Think about uh, grocery stores that can deliver food to you now. You don't even have to go inside of a grocery store to get groceries, right? Just because they're not limited to brick and mortar does not mean that their business has gone down. In fact, most have pivoted and grown towards beyond their brick and mortar. But how many senior living communities, how many senior living companies have grown beyond the walls of their own operations? Now, what you're looking at here, operating leverage, what that really means for us is that when times are good, they're really good. If you have high occupancy and you've met the basic costs of having the land, having the building, paying for your labor, once you're above that threshold, things are pretty good. But here's the downside. Here's the double-edged sword of a high operating leverage business like senior living is that when times are bad, they are particularly bad. Even if you don't have new residents moving in, you still got to pay for all of those fixed expenses. And therein lies the challenge for us in trying to innovate and meet all of those other needs that aren't taken care of. Okay. This is, best, this is a, an average or even a best case scenario, by the way, this pie, pie chart that you're looking at. And I want you to think about within that orange, yellow portion of this pie, what percentage of that is attributed to resident engagement? So if the entire pie is 100%, think about in a senior living community, what percentage of the budget out of 100% is going to be attributed to resident engagement? Here's kind of a sobering thought. Um, most communities, most senior living companies are not operating under the best of circumstances. A lot of places are struggling with low occupancy. And this creates kind of a downward death spiral where you almost cannot innovate, uh, where you almost could not put more money into resident engagement, into technologies, into the different ways that we can create senior living as a service rather than just a place to go. So if you can see it here, what I did was I took an average uh, budget for a senior living community and I put it here in red on the pie chart. So resident engagement, all of those things missing from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're going to give you this little bitty piece of the pie to try and get all of that done. Here's kind of something interesting. I wanted to put this in a way that might resonate with us that, that we might think of this in an ongoing basis. Say you have a community with 100 residents that live there and your budget, your monthly budget for resident engagement is $1,500. Um, I 
this is not a hypothetical situation. I've been an executive director. I've been a resident engagement director. And I can tell you that this is pretty close to what communities get uh, on a monthly basis, 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks. Um, if you're above that, if you're 3000, 4000, you're probably at a pretty high end senior living community. So at $1,500 a month for 100 residents, this works out to $180 per resident per year. Per year, $180 per resident per year. Again, these are hypothetical numbers, but I think they're pretty close to what uh, communities are budgeted for. Here's the crazy part. The average American, the average American adult spends $3,050 annually just on entertainment alone. Now, that statistic is from September 2020. So even, I mean, I assume that this incorporates some of the uh, pandemic time, but just think about it in your own life. Do you spend, you know, somewhere around $3,000 a year on just entertainment purposes? Compare that to $180 per year on socialization, spiritual needs, emotional needs, psychological needs, everything that makes human growth and purposefulness relevant for you. So that's a pretty wide difference. And here's kind of the problem I see in, in the senior living model as it exists today. It, it works against us when we're trying to expand or innovate in these quote unquote non-core services. The core services that we talk about are housing, care, right? Um, but we don't really address psychological, self-actualization, purposeful, all of those things in, in, in a real sense. So how do we get past this? How do we move past this when we have so much fixed cost to have to cover uh, in order for us to get there? Well, this is where I challenge us to look at other industries and how they've done it. How have you been able to get past the brick and mortar? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause on that question to introduce now the role of technology. And what is technology meant to do for us and in our lives? So um, the role of technology is really, it's to help you um, reduce friction in the way to solving a problem for yourself. So a hammer, a screwdriver is technically technology. Um, it's anything, it's a set of tools, it's a set of skills and knowledge that you put together to get better uh, or more efficient at solving a problem. So here's, here's an example. Here's a person with a goal. This is a non-senior living example, by the way. This is a person with a goal and his problem is I'm alone. I'm alone in life. I need a partner. I need a life partner, uh, but I'm just too busy to, to, to do anything about it. This is my problem. I can't get out and meet somebody. Introduction of the technology piece here. The technology is I'm gonna pull and, and find all of these potential suitors for you. And we're gonna solve the problem of you not having enough time to go out and meet people. So we're gonna provide technology to bring those people to you. Through the technology, you've achieved your goal. Simple, simple example here, but that's the role of technology. The app, the phone, that's not technology. That's how the technology is delivered. It's how it's transferred. But the technology here is the ability to pull those resources together for somebody and help them solve a problem. So if the person, now replace this person who's just looking for a date or a person to marry, um, and replace that person with our senior. What is their goal? Now, just to kind of go back to the general concept here of uh, the hierarchy of needs, their goal is not to have a place to live. Their goal is not to receive care. Their goal is to continue their pursuit of self-attainment, self-actualization, purposefulness. And senior living, as we've talked about now, is not really set up to do that. The way that our industry right now looks at the role of technology, I think is a little too narrow. So if you were to poll just an audience of senior living um, managers, and you said, what technology exists in your community today? They might tell you some of these things that are on the screen. We have an EHR, we have a sales CRM that has an app, we have Wi-Fi throughout the community. 
but think about how is that actually solving the problem for our seniors, right? Um, having these technologically capable things, features of our community is great, but are they solving the problem? Um, I think that senior living, uh, again, with love and profound respect for what we do, um, I think that what we have right now is basically a warehouse model. We try and find seniors, these are the, the, the green circles here, um, forgive the elementary version of this, but uh, I think it conveys the point. Um, you're finding all of these seniors outside of the community and the arrows are pointing in. Get them to the senior living community and we'll have some technology that lets them enjoy life here. So we're packaging everything up. You got to come live with us and you're going to get all of these benefits from us. Think about how appealing that, uh, that value proposition is going to be for seniors of tomorrow. Heck, seniors of today, right? Um, I think that there's probably a different way for us to take a look at the role of technology. The value of senior living is not the physical space that we occupy. In fact, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, I think it inhibits innovation. I think it, it actually prevents us to, to reach out uh, and think of new ways to serve our, serve our senior population. The real value that we have as an industry is not the bricks and mortar. The real value that we have is our know-how. We know how to do this. We know how to coordinate resources. We know how to get experts that are involved in the, the full wellness of seniors to solve this problem. And here's, here's, here's kind of a key takeaway from this entire conversation. The role of technology is not to run a business. I'm gonna say that again. The role of technology is not to run a business. It is to solve a problem for our customers. And if you think about what the problem is for our customers, I'm gonna go back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs here. The problem is that the senior has a goal and they're climbing back up Maslow's hierarchy here, right? The, the way I think about this is for most of us, you know, um, as, we, as we get older from young adolescent age and we kind of grow up, we go from physiological safety, physiological needs to safety needs and then beyond. We're climbing up. So we haven't tasted esteem. We haven't tasted self-actualization. So this is like the first time I ever ate an ice cream sandwich. I didn't know what I was missing. But once I had the ice cream sandwich, it was like, oh crap, that's what an ice cream sandwich tastes like. Now I'm missing the thing that I've experienced. Seniors have tasted the ice cream sandwich. Seniors have experienced the pursuit of esteem. Seniors have experienced the, the attainment of self-actualization. So when they start to slide down that pyramid and have to um, supplement physiological needs and safety needs, it is not that they have completely gotten rid of self-actualization and psychological needs. They've always been there, but it's like, it's like that uh, ice cream sandwich example of I've tasted it before, so I know what I'm missing. Senior living has to step in there to recognize how are we solving this problem, um, not of care, not of housing, but this, this whole person approach to what does this senior want? And that goes all the way back to our very first slide. Our seniors have the exact same needs as every other adult group. So I think that's where we need to expand our, our thought approach uh, to, to senior living as a service. So here's kind of an idea that I have. I'm gonna go back to the, 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 the uh, image of the warehouse model and just flip it, okay? The arrows are now pointing out. The arrows are pointing out from our communities, the arrows are pointing out from our businesses, and we're gonna go meet seniors where they are. I don't mean get rid of senior living communities, by the way. All I mean is that senior living communities are the most uh, well-positioned players in the field that could coordinate these services and get them out. Think about your grocery store. We have HEB down here. I don't know what the Virginia equivalent of that is, um, but, People down here love HEB. Um, they love being able to get groceries delivered. Uh, right after this, uh, this presentation, I can get on a mobile app and get my groceries on a cart and just go pick it up after work. Why couldn't senior living 
create that environment for seniors. Think about these company examples. Airbnb is a hospitality business that doesn't own any hotels. Uber doesn't have any cars. Amazon doesn't have any retail stores. So why couldn't senior living exist without buildings? I think that is the big question that maybe we're going to try to answer in this next evolution, this next stage of senior living services. Um, if we act as a hub and spoke model, we can think of senior living as a service and not as a place. We have to be able to go beyond our established way of doing things and think, well, you have to come to us to get the service. We need to be able to flip that around. Looking ahead, so we're, we're kind of at the end of our presentation. Micah, I told you I would be finished by 145, so I, I, I'm almost there. Uh, looking ahead, um, here are some discussion questions, and we won't have time to go through all of this today, but based on what we just went through, uh, or based on what I just soapboxed to all of you, um, I hope that it has made you think about some questions, or if questions aren't coming to mind yet, look at what's on the screen here. Uh, one of the best ways to engage with me and talk with me is through LinkedIn. In fact, that's how I met Micah Hunt. Uh, LinkedIn is a really great place to engage with me. So I have an ask of you. I have a challenge for you. Um, if you're on LinkedIn, what I would really love is for you to take one of these questions, copy and paste it, just write it down. Now I want you to post it on your own LinkedIn Pro, uh, post it on, on LinkedIn. Tag me in it, tag Micah in it, so we can engage in the conversation. But I'd love for you to pose this question, one of the ones that resonates with you, and give us your answer. Um, and let's start a dialogue. Let's start dialogues like this with people in our industry. So we're thinking beyond how do we solve occupancy right now. Let's think beyond that and think how do we, how do we transform senior living to be a service and not just a place to live. Okay, I think, I think that's the end, Micah. Here's my conclusion slide. Congratulations, everyone. You've made it through another webinar. Uh, this is my headshot that I use for everything. It is five years old. I'm not going to change it until I don't look like that anymore. My email address is on the screen. My phone number is on the screen. Uh, that's my personal number. So if you have a question, a comment, or just want to say, you know, James, uh, I, I didn't agree with what you had to say, that's okay. Reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd prefer to talk to people who are like, oh yeah, I like that message. So, you know, those people I'll, I'll respond to first. Um, I want to say real quick, I know I, I know I zipped through all of that. Uh, sorry for not taking a breath through my presentation, but as you can tell, I'm really, really passionate uh, about this topic. I think we got to do better. We can do better. And there's a lot of models that we can follow to get there. Um, but what we have that those other industries don't have is our heart connection to the work, right? I'm not saying that grocery stores don't feel a connection to their work or CPAs don't feel connected. Of course they do. But think about how wonderful it would be if our industry could transform in the same way. Maybe 10 years from now, somebody will be pointing to our industry saying, if senior living can innovate, we can too. Guys, thank you for listening to me today. I, I, I hope this was valuable for you. Let's start this conversation, um, and thank you for everything you do. Micah, back over to you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. You can uh, stop sharing your screen at your convenience. That was some pretty, uh, as somebody said, thought-provoking, for sure. So um, now it's time for questions. Does anybody have any questions for James Lee as of right now, or comments, or just want to share a thought with him in regards to what he was just sharing? Um, anybody at all? Nobody has a thought-provoking thought for, for James. Wow. That's... Well, any of, those, any of those questions could work too. So I, I know I stopped <laughs> sharing the screen here. Um, but, you know, you rather go, than... You want to go back to it? Sure, sure. I can do that. Um, you know... Oh, oh somebody. Yeah. I, I, Micah, this is Alden Rice with Always Best Care in Richmond, yep. Virginia. And James, I just got to say, so Always Best Care, we help families find assisted living communities. Yeah. And I sit, you know, we hold their hands. We walk them through the whole process. I sit with marketers all day long who are promoting, you know, the socialization aspect, who are promoting all the services of their mm -hmm. um, particular senior living community. And I have never once thought of 
how it relates to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I just, so what a thoughtful approach, you know, and I, I, wow, I, this is by far one of the more interesting presentations. Um, it's going to stick with me and I'm going to be ruminating on this and I will definitely be reaching out because Thank you. Um, we marginalize our seniors and, and it's a societal thing. It's, it's the American way. Um, and we don't often think we, we, we view safety, that, that slide that shows the safety, that we, we take away their ability to continue growing as humans just to assure their safety. Mm -hmm. and, then, and we think that we're doing them a service when we do that. We think yeah. that's the right thing to do. And yeah. that's, not, that's not necessarily the right way to go. So I just thank you for making me think in a way I haven't thought in a, in a long time. Well, I, I appreciate those comments, um, Alden. And um, I, I, I think you're right. And by the way, I want, I want to say again, and also answer uh, one of the questions here, did I work in assisted living or senior living? Yes, for the last 12 years, um, I've been in the senior living operating housing um, vertical. So I've been an executive director, I've held various corporate leadership positions. So uh, I'm, I'm certainly speaking from a place of, um, you know how you, you're, you're uh, your friends, you know, you can make fun of your friends, your friends can make fun of you, but anyone outside, don't, don't talk about us. Um, that's the approach I have here. I love what we do. I'll do this work for as long as God allows me to be doing this work. So this is not a criticism uh, of our industry, but more so a challenge for us to look at things outside of the narrow view of each of our departments or our positions or even our companies. Let's pull back a little bit and look at the bigger problem, which is are we doing right by what we promise to do. And we're all well intended, but I think these conversations are less about pointing fingers and much more about challenging our thought process um, in pursuit of solving those problems. Wow, that's a, that's a bold statement. I mean, oh. it, it really makes you hit your-, I, your, your ate, I ate my witties. I <laughs> ate my Wheaties this morning, so yeah. <laughs> But it, it is. It's one of those things where, you know, you, you have to look at the bigger picture and remember why did we get involved in senior living? You know, we had a passion, we had a draw, and we just have to kind of focus and hit, hone in on that and remind ourselves that we are in this to help the seniors have a better quality of life. Yeah. Um, one of the other, somebody else, uh, Cheryl asked, um, can you call out any companies who get this concept most? Um, a sharp resident at a California community suggested the idea of expanding on the senior center idea by providing more services? Mm, yeah, um, that's a great question. I, it, it's, it's hard for me to kind of think of people who are this, this far out. I think there are some companies that are experimenting with, um, gosh, I, I forget the name of the organizations, um, but, uh, but there are a few. Uh, Cheryl, I'll remember your name. We're connected on LinkedIn, actually. So um, I'll message you privately. I do think there are organizations pushing the boundary on this. Um, and the way that that looks is that they have like membership programs where seniors can participate in the services of that community, but not have to live there. Um, there are new constructions that build senior living into uh, more robust urban areas. So you're not just living in the suburbs with seniors, you're incorporated into, um, like you're above a coffee shop and next to, you know, um, shopping areas. So I, I think that there's a lot of good companies starting that. Um, and I think that's a, that's a starting point for, for this kind of um, aggressive innovation, I'll call it. CCRC without walls, that's right, Cheryl. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments or suggestions they'd like to share or personal experiences um, that you'd like to, to open up with um, at all? Okay, I'm gonna stop recording.